This week on What to Watch, Supergirl is ending after six long seasons, which is still 10 minutes shorter than the Snyder Cut. Everyone out, now! Plus, The Challenge All-Stars is premiering, and no, it's not a show about how much Smash Mouth you can tolerate. Don't mess with me. <laughs> And Christopher Maloney is resurrecting his beloved Law and Order character, but happy fans don't hold your breath. I just kept waiting for the right moment. Add a plus sign to your streaming site. It's time for What to Watch. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Entertainment Weekly's What to Watch, the show where EW staff help you solve your viewing dilemmas. I'm your host, Jared Hall, and rounding out the final four bracket that I just put together just now are staff writer Chancellor Agard, digital features director Jessica Dershowitz, and digital writer Sydney Buxbaum. Hey, everyone. How are you? Hey, Hello. Jared. Hi, thanks for being here. All right, well, let's get into it. Folks, it is a sad day in the Arrowverse because next Tuesday, the CW is kicking off the sixth and final season of Supergirl. It sounds like our hero, Cara Danvers, played by Melissa Pinoist, will have a lot on her plate heading into the new season, like, oh, I don't know, face-offs with villains like Jim Cooper and Lex Luthor? Hmm, and that's just the beginning. However, fans won't be saying goodbye to Kara and her super friends just yet. While the first half of the final season is premiering next week, the second half likely won't return until the summer. So, Chance, you're up. What can we expect from this first batch of episodes, and how quickly will Season 5's storylines get resolved? Um, season 5's sort of dangling thread uh, gets immediately resolved in the premiere, really. that's the, It ties up a bunch of loose ends, because I think Supergirl was in the middle of shooting its season five finale when everything shut down because of mm. the thing. Um, yeah. And so it really gets, so then the premiere really just picks up right where it left off and um, just plows ahead in sort of wrapping everything up uh, before ending on a really cool cliffhanger that really th gives sort of Supergirl or Inkara this uh, really ch uh, big challenge and I guess challenges her in a way that we've never seen before really. Without getting into spoilers, it's definitely like um, the showrunners talked about how Kara will be facing her mortality in a new way this season, and um, that is definitely the case with this first batch of episodes, given where the premiere leaves off. As I mentioned, the the uh, season will be broken up into two parts due to the Superman and Lois schedule, so it might be a little too soon to talk about the finale, but here's what I'm wondering. What would it take for fans and you uh, to be like satisfied with the ending of the show? What do you want to see happen? I think one thing that a lot of fans or a very vocal contingent of fans would love to see is for the show to finally go there with Kara and Lena because there are a lot of fans that ship these two these two these two characters together. So um, I feel like that's something that a lot of fans want to see. Uh, two new characters will be joining the show this season. They're played by Claude Knowlton and Jason Bear. We'll also be getting the return of uh, Gemma, as as I mentioned, and Lex Luthor. Uh, what can you tell us about any of those? Well, um, in terms of the two new characters, uh, Knowlton is playing this sort of uh, alien who uh, will help the Super Friends with a mission, again, uh, avoiding spoilers. And then um, and then Jason Bear will be playing this Kryptonian whose name they're keeping under wraps, but he will help sort of Kara with the aforementioned challenge I was talking about. And then um, Kelly, uh, w what do we know about this character? Oh, yeah, sorry, Kelly Olsen, yes, I forgot to mention that. Um, I mean, this is really exciting. So Zita Sfai, who plays Kelly Olsen, James Olsen's sister, she is sort of making Arrowverse history this season by, because uh, she co-wrote an episode. She's the first Arrowverse writer to ever contribute to a script. And she co-wrote um, a season, uh, an, an episode later in the season with supervising producer Jay Holtham that will be directed by Arrow alum uh, David Ramsey, who will also appear in the episode as his Arrow character. And... Um, the episode's really exciting because it's one of the um, episodes that will deal with social justice, something that the show has sort of sort of tackling um, towards the back half of its run. Um, and so uh, there aren't any details around that yet, but that is something that, that everyone involved is really excited about, um, especially just having three black, uh, like the creative team being three black uh, creators on it as well. It's something to really, really excited about. Um, on top of that, uh, Kelly will sort of officially pick up the Guardian mantle this season as well, which is um, her brother James Olsen, sort of superhero alias from before he left the show as well. So that's something fans have been begging for. Um, and we got a tease of in the last crossover when she used Guardian Shield. And so that's another thing that they can look forward to. All right. Uh, you, you mentioned there uh, the show um, tackling, uh, you know, justice and all of that. This season they'll be talking about power. Uh, elaborate a bit more on that for us. How, how will the series tackle that subject? 
Well, I think um, so. One of the sort of uneasy parts of the show for 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 its entirety of its run has been the fact that like Supergirl and her friends work for this like government organization called the DEO, which is basically their job to monitor aliens. And it's sort of like queasy having this sort of really close relationship between like Supergirl and the military and turning her into an agent of the government, which is anyway. And so luckily in season five, the DEO was destroyed. Um, and so now the super friends are sort of operating without any sort of government oversight. So the season's really about th- them figuring out what are their limits? What limits should they place on themselves? I mean, it just, it goes back to the whole Spider-Man thing of with great power comes great responsibility. It's of how do they wield their power responsibly? So that is, and that was sort of inspired in part by just sort of watching sort of uh, both the Black Lives Matter movement over the summer mm-hmm. and also just um, how people also just felt sort of powerless because of the pandemic and sort of finding ways to, and sort of exploring the idea of how do people feel empowered and again, go about that responsibly. Yeah, well, it sounds like that is shaping up to be a great season. Well, we need to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're saying goodbye to the challenges in National City and hello to the challenge. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Long before TikTok thought it made them a thing, MTV was where we got all of our challenges. And April 1st, we're getting the best of the best when the iconic competition reality series returns with the challenge All-Stars, which now makes me wonder what like a crossover between the challenge and RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars would be, but that's for another time. Now in its 37th season, making it old enough to run for president, they are reuniting all of our favorite real world and road rule challenge alums and sorry newer fans, no are you the oneers? No survivors, no big brothers or Geordies, just the classics. And this marks the first season. It's streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. Sydney, we've got some real old school favorites on the cast here. Who are you most excited to see return? And, and how is it seeing some of these vets competing in for the first time in a really long time? Yeah, it has been a long time for some of these players. I think I'm most excited to see like the old school heavy hitters like Mark Long and Alton and Ruthie and Tech and Kendall return because yeah. it has been so long since they've been on this franchise, but like they still have that beast mentality presence and I expect big things from them in regard to like athletic performance as well as, you know, we we've seen Darrell and Derek on this show for a lot of the recent seasons, but they're also back and they actually have most the most wins out of anyone on this um, roster. So I expect mm-hmm. big fr- things from them also. Um, but I think what's really exciting is we're seeing these old school players in the like new school challenges. So it's not mm-hmm. going to be like the like jokey kind of, <laughs> you know, not as hard to do challenges of the like old school seasons. They're like going to be on these high flying contraptions that's going to be like x game mode and i think a lot of them are not expecting that so that's going to be um really fun to see um and i think i i'm most excited for the drama factor from like the ultimate villains trishel and beth because you know they're going to be involved in all of the fights this season and they are not they haven't changed at all let's just put it that way (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) And I think I'm least excited to see Big Easy return because I have never forgiven him for costing the champion team their win in Gauntlet 3 because that is the only win that DM would have had in her entire career. And Mm. that's just unforgivable in my eyes. So even though he's also going to bring the drama, I hope he goes home very early. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So that, um, that, that rivalry you mentioned, is that like kind of like some of the drama you're most excited for? I think a lot of people will have some issues with Big Easy because of that. Um, but I mm-hmm. think Beth and Trishel are just going to be bringing the drama just for drama's sake. Like Trishel, she just can't help it. They know it. how she... to make TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beth yeah. is the ultimate villain because she knows exactly what she's doing. Like she mm-hmm. is there to cause problems and just laugh at everyone's misery. So that is really exciting that they got her back for this season. Who, historically speaking, um, are some of the obvious front runners for this season? I think the players who stand the greatest chance at winning is obviously Mark Long because not only was he the one spearheading the campaign to get these OGs back for the special season, he is clearly the one who's kept up in the best shape. Like he does his, you know, signature flex pose of the trailer and that's how you know he's back and better than ever. 
Um, but I wouldn't count out Darrell because he's fresh off his time in double agents. And he actually told me the other week after he was eliminated that he has felt the best he's ever felt coming into All Stars. But honestly, you never know what's going to happen on this show. So I'm ready for some crazy twists and turns. Okay, uh, moving on. There is another franchise we are excited to see return this week, and we know a lot of fans are too. It's The Mighty Ducks Game Changers, Disney Plus's brand new TV series based on the classic hockey films of the same name. Uh, Emilio Estevez reprises his role as Coach Gordon Bombay, and he's joined by Lauren Graham, who's also one of the co-executive producers here. Uh, Sydney, how does the series continue the story of the Ducks, and, and how do we think fans of the old films are going to feel about it? It's interesting. When they first announced this show, I was excited, but also kind of worried because the three movies were just so perfect and like, why mess with the magic? But I think what they're doing is really interesting and creative. The Mighty Ducks Game Changer starts off with this kid getting cut from the team because he's just not good enough to be on it. And so he and his mom, played by Lauren Graham, start their own hockey team of underdog misfits, which was what the Mighty Ducks were in the original movies. So it's a fun little like subverting of expectations, but it also makes sense if you think about it because if the Mighty Ducks won all their big championships three movies in a row back in the 90s, of course they were going to continue to go on and get better and better until yeah. they eventually became the teams that they were always trying to beat in the first place. So I think while some fans may be upset to know that the Ducks are now the, you know, quote unquote villains. I think it's a really cool way to keep this franchise feeling fresh and do something new and not just rehash what we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. All right, we need to take a quick break, but when we return, I'm going to introduce you to my new friends, Law and Order. We'll be right back. Welcome back to What's Watch. Take your mind back, if you will, to 2010, a time where being able to explain Inception was a virtue, the only Netflix original programming was the startup animation, and new Law & Order series were easier to spot than dead bodies in Central Park. Well, things have changed over the next decade with the only current surviving show of the franchise's heyday being Special Victims Unit, or SVU for all you ALs out there. That's abbreviation lovers. I-Y-K-Y-K. -Y -K. Uh, but all that changes next week as Law & Order Organized Crime joins the family and it's bringing along SVU's Elliot Stabler with it. Jess, will this series mark a new Law & Order renaissance on TV? Or dun dun assance, if you will? <laughs> I'm done. A new addition to the <laughs> SV universe is the uh, very lame line that I've been using. And but... I love it. I champion it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. No, mm -hmm. I'm very excited. I mean, it's been, SVU is in its 22nd season. It has yeah. been going for so long now, but it's really been a decade since we've seen Elliot Stabler on the show. And so much has changed in the context of the show and also obviously in the world in the decade since. So having him come back is going to be so fascinating and seeing how he... Um, works into this new uh, framework that they have for the show, which is organized crime. So he's not, mm -hmm. no special victims here. Well, maybe. But. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, I, you know, let's just tell it like it is here. Fans were pretty pissed off when he left the show uh, a decade ago, but, but does this feel like a long time coming or like now is the right time? I think that people would have been happy to see him come back anytime. Uh, they're very excited that it's happening right now. And personally, I think that this is a really interesting time to do it because even people who loved Elliot Stabler so much when he was on the show could not argue the fact that he was sort of a bit of a loose cannon. Like mm -hmm. Olivia was always the good cop and then he was the bad cop who would come in later and interrogate people and beat people up and the kind of stuff that was never like kosher, but we now know so much more that it's definitely not. So seeing how... Stabler, the character, comes back into the show now in the present day, in 2020, 2021, at a time when we're talking more about policing in real life and how policing should be depicted on TV. Mm -hmm. He's going to have a lot to learn, and it's going to be a very different environment than the one that he left. And he has a few people uh, helping him along the way, some uh, TV veterans joining him there. Please tell everyone who those are, because these are some good names. Oh my God. I mean, when they announced that Dylan McDermott was joining the show, I just was like, yes, <laughs> yeah. it's so exciting. I mean, 
for a lot, so many people who watch the show, like Stabler and Benson are Endgame. They are like the partners to end all partners. So it's mm-hmm. going to be strange seeing him not interact with Olivia on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. But it'll be really cool to see like a new cast of characters and a whole new, you know, uh, department for him to work mm-hmm. his way through. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about Olivia for a second, because uh, as you mentioned, she she will not be part of the show, but they will reunite for a very brief hour. Tell everyone about that. Yes. So this two hour block is a very important part of my calendar. <laughs> so <laughs> SVU is going to have an episode at nine o'clock that Stabler mm-hmm. is going to make his reemergence into the universe of the show during. So we will see the two of them interact. They released a little teaser a couple of weeks ago where you didn't see them together, but you heard him say her name. And even that was just like, ooh, all right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's back. Elliot's back. You know, the thing with uh, Law and Order is the, these shows are, you know, they're endlessly watchable and, and you can just, you know, if you're scrolling cable and, and, you know, scrolling the TV and find one, you can just watch. You don't really need to know a ton about the universe uh, because they very much operate as standalone episodes in a lot of ways. But organized crime by nature is going to be more serialized. So do you think this is this is a, a great new innovation for the franchise or does it kind of feel like blasphemy? <laughs> you know, I... I'm here for it. I think that because it's organized crime, it makes more sense to have these sort of longer running threads that we can continue pulling at over the course of a season. But if you look at SVU, there have been, you know, arcs over Mm. all the past seasons where uh, characters come back or it takes them a couple of episodes to, you know, get the big bad or there's stuff in people's backstories like Olivia adopting a son that have been ongoing now for years and years. So I don't think it's going to feel too different. Or I mean, it will. Yes, it will absolutely be different. It, it won't be resolved in the content in the confines of an episode every single sure. time. But I think that people will be more accustomed to it than maybe they're expecting. Uh, all right, we need to take a quick break. But when we get back, it's time for this crew to join the Wolf Pack. Welcome back. With the premiere of Organized Crime, the Law & Order universe has aired about 1,200 episodes across seven different shows over 30 years. But by my count, they're due for about a writer's block just about any time now. And that's where we come in. Chance, Sydney, Jess, it's time for Pitch Sesh. All right, you ready? This is the part of the show where we combine our collective brain powers to write an unsolicited pitch for a series that will sweep the Emmys for years to come. In the past, we've cold called David E. Kelly and fully cast Betty White's origin story, but today, let's try a spinoff, Law and Order, colon, something. So first of all, what is the scope of our show? Like who in the NYPD haven't we ridden along with yet? Do we hit the streets with traffic cops? Maybe turn the tables and follow uh, the Internal Affairs Bureau? Maybe police horses? What are you guys thinking? What should it be? Law and order, colon? Animal control. Hmm. All stars. I was gonna say. <laughs> Out of con- Law and order, all stars? Is that what you said, Chance? I did, yes. You know, okay, okay, look. Okay, look. So, like, if we're gonna, like, just keep rebooting old stuff and bringing mm-hmm. old, old characters back, like, sure, then why not just go all the way with it and just, like, in keeping in the vein of, like, the challenge we were just talking about, all stars, you know, we get... You get Stabler in there. You get uh, Vincent D'Onofrio in there. You get Goldblum's uh, Zach Ooh. Nichols in there, dude. Come on. I, I want to see Goldblum Goldblum again. That's actually not a bad idea. I was saying the same thing as Jess, though. Law and Order Animal Control, because in my mind, I'm thinking of like the Parks and Rec like animal guys. Yes, and I was is... going to say there could be a crossover episode. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about casting. Uh, we'll need... You got to have two partners, I think, at the center of this and plus their boss and maybe uh, like a wild card in there, like an Ice T or, or Chance mentioned, you know, like a, a Jeff Goldblum. Who do we think? Like who's clean? Who's dirty on this show? If we're going to go with, let's say, Animal Control, which maybe we'll bring in some all-stars for. Bill Hader. Oh, oh that's a good one. That's mm. really good. Because he can do Bill the drama Hader. and the comedy. You know, Uh so he could play either the straight shooter or the wild card. He really is a jack of all trades. I like that. I like that. Okay, on brand pitch, Hugh Laurie (laughs) as the sort of uh, medical examiner slash veterinarian. (laughs) Would he have a a quirky, eccentric? Uh, No, 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 no. (laughs) And because the Law and Order franchise has a long history of casting Broadway actors, I am going to say that Kristen Chenoweth should be Bill Hader's partner. Ooh. Ooh. 
And also there's a great that. dynamic there because he's like seven feet tall and she's like three feet tall. So Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so you've got some good visuals too. Uh, I like this pairing. Would she like sing to the animals, you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it only makes sense. She would have to. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, all right, now uh, the, the best part of any Law and Order really the crime. All right, so Law & Order loves a ripped from the headlines case. We all know that. So what felony or misdemeanor can we remix for our special task force? And and of course, there have to be A-list guest stars uh, who are acting very suspicious. So uh, we need a crime and guest stars. Well, the well, the premiere would have to be like a take on the like the, on like Lady Gaga's dog being kidnapped, right? <gasps> Ooh. Yep, totally. Okay, okay. Good one. That's ripped right from recent headlines. Yeah. Who would we have playing Lady Gaga? Would she play herself? Oh, absolutely. That would only make it more real. <laughs> yeah. See, okay. I think that they would they would write like a Lady Gaga inspired singer named like mm -hmm. Madam something. Ha ha. Not, yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Madam Ha Ha. Okay. And, and cast somebody to play her. So it would not be Lady Gaga playing herself. Oh my God. Wait, wait Jess, okay. who, who was in Sunday in the Park with George with, with Jake Jones Hall? I'm, I'm blanking on her name. She was Annalie on, Ashford. On Evil. There we go. Yes. Yes. Annalie Ashford as not Lady Gaga. Yes. All right. So here is what we are taking to uh, NBC and the one and only Mr. Dick Wolf. In the animal control system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. The Broadway stars who investigate the crimes and the all-stars who sing to the animals. These are their stories. Law and order, animal control, the Madam Ha Ha story. <laughs> Done. We like it? Six scenes in a movie, please. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. It sounds like a, a, a hit to me. I think we've done done it again. <laughs> You like that? Okay. Canceling the show I'm now. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to stop. All right, Dick Wolf, I really hope you're paying attention. All right, you guys, that is our show. My thanks to Sydney Bucksbaum, Chancellor Agard, and Jessica Dershowitz. We will see you all next week on What to Watch.